Hi, I'm Owen Gillis. Uh, here with the Center for Sailing Society. You can check out our website at cfrss.org. Uh, I'm going to start really fast. So, knowledge is asymmetric. Freedom is asymmetric. The more means by which people can act, the easier attack becomes, and the harder defense becomes. It's a simple matter of complexity. The attacker only needs to choose one line of attack. The defender needs to secure against all of them. This isn't just true of small thermal exhaust ports. It's also true in our software ecosystems today and any other system with many dimensions of complexity or movement. Complexity, more degrees of freedom within the system, allow for greater attack surface when they can come from not just all points on the compass, but from above and below. The arc of human history is an arc bent by our creativity and our inquiry towards more options, more ways of existing and acting, towards greater freedom. Every human invention expands the immediate a number of means we have to act. And intertwined with this freedom has come, of course, greater destructive capacity. From the eon when only elite, when an elite uh, few could only be warriors, when attack was the purview of a select, to an era when anybody could perish, spear or sword, or kill maybe one other person before dying, to the era to the era of the musket and the automatic weapon that empowered small forces to have huge impacts. Today, each and every one of us carries small grenades around in our pockets and bags as an incidental byproduct of storing charge for our laptops and our phones. Tomorrow, the hobbyist with an RNA printer in her garage in Seattle will be able to download or tweet together an Ebola SARS death pox of such apocalyptic virulence that it would never evolve naturally. This is not a danger posed by a single technology. It is the inherent and the very arc of our technological development itself. As our tools expand, or as our physical freedom expands, they force changes to our social freedom. As we've progressed through our accelerating technological development, as the knowledge we've, uh, we've discovered and the tools we've invented have inexorably expanded our capacity to, to attack, our social systems have evolved too. They've had to. From honor systems to deal with the few great warriors to early majoritarian democracies where counting heads was roughly as good as determining how a battle between sides would play out. But as our technologies expand, our capabilities, the, projection, the, protection, uh, the protection of minorities, and the lowest of the low has become increasingly important. From muskets in the woods that enable the minority of insurrectionaries to break from the British Empire, sticks of dynamite, the great leveler, as it became known, to the working class and the struggles of the progressive era. Our social systems, our political institutions, our civic morals have grudgingly adapted to this changing context, but they have not adapted fast enough. When we talk about the stunning advancements and, and changes that have been unleashed by the feedbacking effects of technological development, there's an understandable desperation in our language. Guys, 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 this is so important. This is a thing. It, 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 there are the risks of this. We'd better do it right. But too often, people respond to incredibly important questions with, well, we'll use democracy, with no analysis of what this actually means. Democracy, in this context, is a cognitive stop. It's a slogan we use to terminate conversations, considerations, to pat, to pat ourselves on the back. The notion that social democracy and transhumanism are reconcilable is absurd. Democracy in the sense of majoritarian decision making is primeval. It stems from a context of how many people you had determined to battle. But even constitutional democracy, menarchism, enlightened socialism, or te technocracy, whatever the system of government requires control in a way fundamentally irreconcilable with technological empowerment. Control is like defense. To function, it requires a pruning away of complexities, of options, of dimensions of movement. To attempt centralized control over technologies and initiate a war that can only be won by totally destroying every meaningful aspect of our technologies. David Cameron, Jeb Bush, and numerous other politicians, government functionaries, and chiefs of police in the supposedly enlightened West have independently called for the outlawing of cryptography. We laugh, we shake our heads, and we say, not here. But I'm here to tell you that what every expert knows, or I'm here to tell you what every expert knows, although we desperately try to hide it. Backdoor systems could totally be made to work, or at least for the state. Not for us, of course, but we don't matter when the goal is control. When the goal becomes control, when nothing else is even possible, when we can't even imagine any alternative than control. When our visions have narrowed so dramatically that we can't fathom other ways to collaborate or resolve conflicts. The internet can very easily become a white of affair where every packet is sent to government-controlled server infrastructure, point to point to point. Devices can be backdoored from factory to consumer. No, pro no production allowed outside the state's purview. We are not yet at the point where fabrication is distributed enough to make suppression or draconian regulation impossible. The abolition of general purpose computing is a real threat, as are calls for the abolition of the internet. 
When it comes to the internet, to information technologies, the dissolution of, of intellectual property, etc., we say that the map is on our side, on the side of freedom. But what, while it often makes authoritarian control somewhat more challenging, those challenges can still be overcome with sufficient force, with sufficient infrastructural rigidity, and with sufficient public support. The most virulent force in the crypto wars and the copyright wars, every other battle over technology in the last three decades has been narrative. We are, in many fronts, in many demographics, losing that battle. And the aristocracy has historically been anti tech Much of the mid-20th century explosion of continental philosophers writing nebulous, obscure screeds against technology and science were from a tradition that knew perfectly well that they had to decrease the technological means people had access to in order to stay relevant, in order to keep traditions relevant. They crafted Orwellian visions of freedom that were about retreating to some kind of confused and protected state of life. The rejection of technology amounted to a rejection of positive freedom, the freedom to. What they encouraged and said was freedom from knowledge, freedom from choice, freedom from growth, freedom from creativity and inquiry. This reactionary current seeps throughout our society. It's immensely influential. It's not to be underestimated. Freedom, too, is disruptive and complex. It expands options. And when truly decentralized, spread to individuals, it makes it impossible for power to function, for any actor, individual, or institution to control the vast, unfathomable diversity and complexity of this world. Impossible to impose edicts, even democratic ones. When liberal or social democrat transhumanists declare that, we need, that what we need is technology under the control of the people, what is never included in such is exactly how that sort of control is supposed to work. What does the world look like in which we have the capacity to stop people from printing AR-15s? Forget the fuzzy-wuzzy associations of democracy or even rare democracy. Ask yourself what actually needs to be done to control gene therapy. Single facilities of government over, uh, overseeing use of high technologies, massive backdoors in everyone's devices that aggressively monitor and limit use, tech totalitarian control of, of every communication on the planet, aggressive raids against all hackers and tinkers, systematic accounting of every fabrication machinery in existence, constant surveillance of anyone with knowledge of how these things work, complete control of all resource allocation on the planet. This is the only outcome for the logic of social democracy when applied to transhuman aspirations. We cannot control advanced technology without an authoritarianism so complete that it would make Hitler and Stalin spin in the graves. So what can we do? Or salivate in the graves, sorry. So what can we do? At a prior conference here, there was a talk on, on superhero narrative. And I brought up a line from the Third Exodus movie in which the president states, what hope does democracy have when people can move cities with their minds? The inevitable response was, well, we need an empathy awakening, a singularity of empathy that clarifies and refines our values. Absolutely. But what does that look like? How do you get there? And what are the mechanisms by, such a world, uh, by which such a world can function? How are disagreements settled, etc.? Thankfully, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's a long-standing movement that has already been tackling these social and ethical issues and developing answers and analysis in depth for the last two centuries. Anarchism as a term was launched by the French journalist Pierre <laughs> a wildly popular reporter and columnist comparable to our Glenn Greenwald today. It was adopted in a way of highlighting and ripping apart an Orwellian use of anarchy to signify both maximal freedom the absence of rulership or power relations, and the simultaneously mean chaotic violence, the presences of competing would-be rulers and fractious power relations. This double use, in which the term without rulership or anarchia is used instead to signify competing power structures, has historically been used to shut down any and all movements focused on liberty, most famously against the peasants in the English Civil War. You want freedom? We all know that freedom is chaotic violence. In this definition, as, promo as promoted by the elites in the Middle Ages, the very idea of not controlling each other, of not domineering each other, of not exploiting, thieving, or doing violence to each other, is written out of our language itself. It is made impossible in some real sense to even think. Perdun attacked this by returning the term to its etymological roots and set off two centuries of consistent, diligent resistance to power. Anarchists have never taken power. We have resisted authoritarianism and oppression in every arena, from calling out Marxism long before its draconian aspirations become public record, to fighting and dying to resist fascism, fighting Franco until he couldn't afford to join Hitler and Mussolini, leading the resistance against the Nazis across the, uh, against the Nazis across the road. We fought the rubber barons, the czars, the oligarchs, and Soviet bureaucrats. And we've been extraordinarily popular in different regions at different points in history, although we have not yet had sufficient critical mass to completely transform the world. In every instance where anarchism surged to localize popularity with a few million adherents, as in Spain, but also in uh, Ukraine and Manchuria, every surrounding power immediately put their wars on hold to collaborate and snuffing out the examples we provided of a better world, of better ways of interacting and settling disputes with one another, that do not turn to control but build a tolerable consensus for all parties when an agreement is needed. 
We've been at the forefront not just of technology like cryptocurrencies and the Tor project, but also we've been at the forefront of struggles against patriarchy. Racism, homophobia, ageism, ableism, etc., etc., etc. Since long before there were popular coalitions like feminism, we smuggled guns to slaves, ran abolitionist journals. We coursed through the veins of our existing society, pioneering myriad social technologies like credit unions and cooperatives. We've consistently served as the radical edge of the world's conscience and played a critical role in, exp in expanding what is possible while developing and field testing new insights and tools. Anarchism, as many commentators have rightly noted, has served as the laboratory of the left of social justice and resistance movements around the world. Even, when we become, even where we remain marginal, the tools we invent eventually become mainstream. You do not need to wonder how people would resolve conflicts if every super-empowered individual was carrying the equivalent of a nuclear veto in their pocket. We've been testing and developing social forums and advanced game theoretic strategies to treat people that way for ethical reasons alone for the last two centuries. We already represent the ethical framework most common navigating a transmuting world of individual super-empowerment. For all of our ostensible marginalization of the jungles of Chiapas and the streets of Athens, we've been preemptively turning out the politics of the future for the last two centuries. And what experience has also brought us is an appreciation for the function of power systems. Their boring mechanical dynamics, the sociopathic cancer of power structures, will not go quietly into the night. There will never be some kind of awakening that makes our rulers suddenly okay with surrendering their control over us, allowing new technologies to make themselves irrelevant. They will not passively sit back and allow alternative of structures and cultures, new worlds to develop in the shell of the old. They have always fought in the attempt of this, and they will need to be fought for the future to be won. Anarchism brings a steely eyed clarity to the landscape in which we struggle. It says the state, that while state power can sometimes secure some changes, the more you use it, the harder it will be to, to dissolve that power itself. It says that while um, Marxists pretended as though their end goal was classless, stateless utopia of maximal freedom, but, this, but the means they chose were incoherent with this goal. You can't Google out people into being free, and you can't regulate the tools people build while we're maintaining a commitment to expanding their options in life, to making us more than human. Ends and means are not precisely one to one, but they are deeply interconnected. And of anarchism and our toolbox of respectful autonomy and consent is the only survivable, the only functional way of handling the ultraviolet limit of expanding technological capacity that we cannot afford to move in opposing directions today. We must move in ways that do not trade away the future for short sighted ameliorations. We can't afford, in short, to take steps backwards towards greater state power, greater power even in the hands of corporate giants like Google, in the hopes that these monsters will. We, we, we feed to make our tasks easier today will somehow wither away on their own accord, somehow comply meekly as technology impedes and resists the power they've grown accustomed to. We must take seemingly more difficult, the seemingly more difficult path forward, but one that also remains consistent. Thankfully, one of, many, one of the other things anarchists makes clear is that we do not have to raise huge legions of, peop uh, of people to our side to win. A tiny, tiny minority can make a huge difference, can make it impossible to control the function can disrupt the rigidity and overextension inherent in the systems that attempt to control us. When I was 13, I put on a rain hood and trucked up the Pacific coast to the streets of Seattle. The last week in November, 1999. That day was, has since become somewhat infamous. Our victory over the WTO ministerial has become mythologized to a dangerous degree, but it's ripped and banged the desperation that was felt beforehand. In the 1990s, as it grew dramatically in legal and economic strain on a post, no one basically knew the WTO existed. The new liberal vision it served was right out of the 80s cyberpunk, one of monopolistic corporate control where capital could move freely across borders, but people could not. In fact, they were left in prison in fact of slave camps, like in Treya and Bangladesh. Of course, today, this remains the case. And today, we also have the TPP. But every observer agrees that the momentum of this process was severely stopped that cold November day. Because a few hundred people fought in the streets, raising such a ruckus that silent processes were derailed significantly. The spectacle of street protests is, of course, not a panacea, just a tactic useful only within a tiny limited context and time frame, and rarely so even at that. But it reflects a broader reality that we have many tools at our disposal to utilize weak points in the overextended and rigid commitments that are in our technical system of control. And in their inability to manage those turning, the, the churning chaos of young students on the streets reflects how computational complexity remains absolutely critical to political issues. We've heard a lot of talk about the ways that technologies have balkanized us, quote unquote. Now, of course, there's plenty of research that also says that insofar as we've also chosen our own families, insofar as we've also chosen people to associate with, discourses to further to become more expert in and to focus our attention on, nevertheless, our, because of the complexity of our associations with everyone else, if you focus, say, for example, on really liking Star Wars and you can your friends who are all fellow geeks who go to like Comic Con and dress up for the like. 
they're going to have a lot of diversity or a lot of complexity in their own perspective. So you may have that one single thing that has pulled you together with them, or if you're a Fox News watcher, you may have that one single thing that pulls you together with other Fox News watchers. But every other person that is with you in that network has themselves all sorts of myriad connections with other things that are unrelated to that single core unifying point. And as a consequence, what researchers have found is that people are better able to integrate better uh, ideas around them, information around them. Yes, they become more vulcanized or they become more you know, focused on, on the people that they're directly is choosing to associate with. They sometimes hear less arguments of people that are directly contrary to them on those fronts, but they actually integrate more information on the whole. However, it is true that our current information age has led to an increased complexity, has led to feedbacking effects where the speed of technological development or the speed of information technology, that, uh, the speed that information technology provides to our communications, to our cultural uh, mutations, has dramatically, exponentially increased the complexity of any number of things, even just humor. I mean, like, look at what was funny in, in the 1800s. Look at what was funny in the 1950s. Look at what was funny in the 1990s. Look at what's funny today. No, look at what was funny in the 70s, which when they were setting cats on fire. Like, the complexity of humor has grown dramatically. The complexity of so many aspects of our culture, of our interrelation, and yes, our politics has grown complexity, has, has grown more complex as well. And with this complexity, and myriad, myriad fronts, comes a, 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 a reduced capacity for control. Um, it becomes much, much harder for politicians to sell simple narratives. They try, and sometimes Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, etc., have certain, certain vocal points, but the amount of trough that it ends up churning up um, the amount of critique. I mean, look at all the people who were really into Obama, and look at the fallout from that as people's politics and as people's politics matured and became more and more complex, more and more nuanced. Sometimes in really weird ways, where each individual becomes something of a wing out of the light. But the point remains that it becomes much, much harder for the state to impose totalizing narratives, for capitalism to impose totalizing narratives. This I like to call is the social. I like to call this process the social singularity because. It's not just enough to unleash AI, it's not just enough um, to extend human lifespan or whatever else. Um, the greatest amount of computational power that is currently locked up in this world is human computational power. And that will be the case for at least another 10 years. <laughs> like, you know, no hard takeoff is going to happen anytime soon. Um, what is possible is, is this singularity, is this cultural singularity, is this internet in which we have, through our communications and our contact with each other, deepened the complexity of our positions, the complexity of our understanding of the world. We read you know, Wikipedia, we take new <coughs> courses, etc. People are becoming more and more educated, they're becoming higher and higher, um, more and more intelligent in many, in many regards. Um, this is true across the board, even the small demographics that you would think the worst of. Um, they are integrating incredibly complex cultural um, developments. Uh, yes. So if, if we are to unleash vast computational power and singularity, I would like to unleash the power that's currently existing within the slums, the favelas, the townships, the people who are currently, the, all the people who are currently being overlooked. Um, there's vast, vast, vast capacity in just being able to better communicate with each other, being able to unleash the people who are currently in those basically slave-like conditions, or have so few options. And that is what's most coherent with expanding technology itself, is expanding now, anarchism comprises a rich ecosystem of theoretical work that it would be laughable to try to address briefly here. If you're interested in game theory and collective action problems, I suggest you read uh, Michael Taylor and Elmer uh, Osram. If you're interested in the way the vast uh, array of discontinuities of scales suppressed by the, uh, uh, the vast uh, array of discontinuities of scales suppressed by the historical subsidy of violence has distorted capitalism to not be a free market remotely and to, and to, uh, to dramatically um, constrain technological development, but also in, uh, also reinforce social hierarchies, then I suggest that you read Kevin Carson and many other uh, uh, thinkers as well. We have polycentric legal systems, David Friedman and Robert Murphy. We also have a stunning array of deep discourse on methodologies and strategies when it comes to paths uh, forward. Peter Gavrilis and David Graeber have found some renown in this regard. But a core anarchism is an ethical philosophy that seeks to expand free will. Its most famous commitments are political, the abolition of the state, the abolition of centralized concentrations of course of power, etc. But it extends further to, for example, critiques of control and interpersonal relations, as well as critiques of ideological rigidity. In this respect, transhumanism represents yet another arm of anarchism, a focus on expanding freedom in physical terms, and a critique of timid retreat to human nature. I'll take questions.
demonstration. Sorry. Uh, what what is it? I mean, what drew you there at such a young age? Well, I kind of treated like a radical parents. So, okay. uh, so, so in that regard, like I, I grew up very early. Like I was like young, supposedly like you know, prodigy or whatever. And I was reading all kinds of like philosophers' works at a really young age. But I also had access to what was given texts. That's um, not cheating. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's sure right. So, so my father was an amnesty. In fact, he organized along with Cesar Chavez, um, and uh, he, I mean, he was a Christian and just a pacifist really down with the kind of humanism that's here in that humanist hall. Um, and my mother was a state economist. Um, but, uh, but nonetheless, I had a lot of access to a lot of things. I was, you know, I, I saw a piece of paper of people really at one young age. I was protected from a bunch of, like, influences at an early age, but then gradually, like, expanded and read vociferously. So, yeah, I was, I was involved in the lead up to Seattle, um, the Direct Action Network, um, in which a bunch of, I mean, <laughs> it's really interesting. Speaking of acceleration, like we talk about, um, we talk about like the way the internet, you know, has expanded like the, the level of atheism in society, but it's also expanded like the speed at which like like really advanced discourses at the time, like in radical feminism or whatever, were incredibly marginalized. In 1999, like in the most radical sector of society, the like you know few thousand people who went up to Seattle, um, there were like 12 people in the corner of the convention center who like. Had like deep critiques of Pedro Revere, we're using language that is now very common. Now, of course, there's all kinds of tangles and, and things to still be worked out in the vast complexity of our current discourses. But um, I, it gives me a lot of gives me a lot of hope that the internet has expanded and made these things mainstream. So you are making a distinction between two and three and one, and then I said correctly, we're kind of down to favor strongly of three and two, right? Yes. So I kind of wonder. You always talk, also talk about social justice and marginalized voices, and I kind of wonder if there's because it seems to me, and I might be wrong because I'm not an expert, that like within the social justice community, there is uh, an agreement or an understanding and consensus that uh, actually classical liberalism is not enough to promote marginalized voices, and that we actually those people need the freedom from uh, certain opinions, or at least we need to provide spaces that are free from certain opinions. So, uh, so there's, I mean, social justice is a big part of this course, right? And there's lots of different perspectives on it. You'll find plenty of people who are incredibly pro freedom of speech. Within it as well, um, there are there are I think valid concerns, and I would frame them this way in the sense that like it's more productive to have a so I have a background in theoretical physics, and it's more productive to have a conversation on theoretical physics with people who also understand that material. And if one if I'm having that conversation, and somebody comes in out of the blue and like derails that conversation to talk about random bullshit, which happens all the time, like we try to shoot them out as quickly as possible and to say like this conversation is just for us. And I think the same thing happens to people who are like most aware of certain forms of oppression. Like, there is overreach, of course. The internet, uh, in many regards, like, lends itself towards rhetorical extremity in the ways that people, like, and also, the, you know, full political positions are often very complex in the ways that they often get stated or people first encounter them online is often very shallow or very limited. So, you'll oftentimes find that people who are fighting in comment sections will say something that is not entirely with the full depth of, of nuance on the subject, or they just may not know it because they're, like, five weeks into it. Um, but I think that also part of that is like structurally, like technologies are not neutral in a lot of ways. And if you have like a comment section that's hierarchical but single threaded or whatever else, then like, you know, the wing nut chimes in just as much as somebody else and it's, it's hard to keep like a coherent thread. And so in those regards, I think that the current structure of the ways that we present discourse on the internet is incredibly like archaic and limited. Um, and so that has driven a certain amount of tension, a certain amount of conflict. Um, that in which people have to like find ways, and you know, on Facebook you can have like circles and you can regulate who's part of a conversation. But on the broader internet, if you're having like a feminist blog or something like that, and somebody's trying to send something that you find idiotic or you don't want to address, you just kind of like find ways to quickly slap them down and excuses for that kind of thing. And I think some of that's legitimate, but I think the solution to this is ultimately technological. Like we need to provide better platforms for people to have. What, what kind of, I'm sorry to take up more time, but I'm curious like what direction you see the technology to make a change there? Well, yeah, so there's a lot of things. So, like, one example, there's a Rails project that a friend of mine uh, and I'm also contributing uh, to go that involves, like, everyone's comments are anonymous, but then, like, there's overlapping filters. So, so this prevents, because there's, there's, there's been a lot of research that, like, when people have, like, names in conversations, it actually doesn't 
diminish the hostility, it increases it because people have to like get entrenched in their position, it becomes like core to their identity, etc. So if you make everything anonymous, that's great, but then you get a bunch of garbage too. So the idea here is that you're able to have like people are able to like say it's a big site like Reddit or some sort of site that gets like 20,000 people or something like that. You can have different teams that have overlapping filters or different filters, and you as a viewer just go through and check what you want to see. Like this team filters out patriarchal language in this sort of dynamic. This team filters out spam. Like this team filters out patriarchal language with this different dynamic, and they disagree. And so the two of them like can choose how to filter their conversations, what things to bring to light, etc. That's the kind of thing that I mean. But even that, I feel, is really primordial. We just haven't spent enough energy or time thinking about this. Kind of thing, so. Yes. Another question. Yes. Um, yeah. No, I'm just I'd like to be about but I was wondering, like, the only thing that I would is the political point that you made, because I think, like, there's a book by Jonathan Hay that talks about why people are more Republican, but he's trying to break down the ideologies of the left and the Republicans, and they say basically, if you buy Republicans, why Republicans get so many votes because their mission state is quite simple, right? That these three principles that people can, like, can, like, we call it an ideology, right? Yeah, I mean, while the Democrats are too nuanced and, like, I mean, I don't think you're nuanced enough, but, <laughs> um, but which, right, right, right. I, so I think part of that is kind of what I was saying in terms of like the rhetoric on the internet sometimes, like simplicity and complexity, they're political dynamics. The complexity or the simplicity of the signifiers that we use and the ways that we construct our thoughts around these things, they have political consequences, including the simplicity of it. And I think that like that's why oftentimes instead of like limited discourses where you have like where the technology limits really like or biases the level of like of depth to which you can go in a conversation or like makes it so that you just have to allow anyone to come in off the streets. I think that inclines people's discourses towards oversimplicity right? and the ways that they like respond to things in the language that they use and I, and the, the ways that they conceptualize stuff. So I think that's I think that's you know similar to the Fox News just like Donald Trump, he's a genuine guy. He's a winner, not a loser. And I think that that like you know resonates with some folks. Um, but I think that like on the whole uh, I mean, the arc of human history is like creativity and inquiry, right? We've built all of this. And so that inherently, like, I would tend to think that at least complexity has a fighting chance in this. And, and, and if Donald Trump is elected, I'll give you five bucks, but... <laughs> I, I don't know, I think, yes, I think to some extent, but I think in some aspects, in some niches of society, it's also the other way So, like, okay, the true example, it's like, like fashion comes back in cycles, right? We have art there now, like, new, 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 so I think some things also get, get dumped down and progressively gets lost, or at least, like, I don't know, probably adapted, but in a certain way also, it's just the same thing. Yeah, I would love to spend like hours talking about complexity and simplicity of my thoughts on them, and I, I totally agree. Like, there's definitely ways in which, like, we. Ch so, for example, major issues like in terms of economics, like this tension between like whether we have more communal forms of economics or we have more competitive market dynamics. And you can go back there and I'll talk to you endlessly about markets and how they can be coherent with like egalitarian goals or with broad liberation and not have not result in concentration of capital's power. But um, I think that a lot of people just don't want to think about market. Dynamics. They just don't want to vote or they, with their dollar. They don't want to like make decisions that complexity is overwhelming sometimes, but like the choices you get in new ways. And I think this has been like established. But that doesn't mean those people don't relish complexity in like crafting songs or poems or other things. They just have different perspectives on what they want to invest in complexity in and why it's inside different directions. I think we have to like integrate that reality in the ways that we deal with things. And sometimes that's cyclical, sometimes that's you know, um, early in your talk, you mentioned uh, an example of an extremely dangerous technology. Um, I might have missed a bit of the, the details at, at, right after that point, but um, I'm interested in um, how, how you think an anarchist society could handle or survive intersection with a technology of incredible deadliness, where one person could... Right, I mean, the, the question here is, like, I mean, the, the, the issue here is a really central one, like, you know, if technology tends to leak out, like, you know, you've heard the reactionary voices here who are talking about, like, well, only the intelligent people will have access, and only they will, like, but, but that doesn't tend to be the case. What tends to be the case is that, like, it becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and easier, and now very poor people have big screen TVs, etc. Um, and the same is, and with the internet, with information technology, it's become incredibly the case. It's hard to, like, hide software or anything and, like, not have that leak out. So the question becomes, like, you know, do you build a world in which there's a comfortable detente between everyone, in which like literally every person 
could, in some sense, have the capacity to become nuclear, right? So, like, it, if that bum on the street has his finger on, on a nuclear veto button, like, no society is going to survive that unless that person has, like, a certain amount of livelihood and, and potential and options and things, like, they give them some empowerment. And, like, and if you try to fight that, if you try to fight that leaking out, the end result is just extreme fascism, especially in the era of information age. Just how would you stop tech people from being able to re-engineer 3D printers themselves to build whatever the crap they like? Like, I mean, nukes are hard to build, but, like, RNA printing is, like, already a thing. Right, people can print viruses, this, this is going to happen, and like EMPs, all kinds of different things, and, and also with like, with technology, with, um, with, uh, with black hat hacking, the, the disruption of the infrastructure, I and mean, it's a slightly separate issue, but the point is people are already getting super empowered in, in many ways, and the question becomes like, do we go full blood fascism or like primitivists to try to stop them, like tear it all down or whatever, and so that we have no more freedom, but at least we have some small level of survivability, um, or do we actually embrace the risk? And do we try to build a society that's egalitarian, that has options, that has freedoms, that is empowering a people and it doesn't impress anyone to the point where they like want to use the nuclear option? And that's a huge, it's a stunning task. I'm not sure that we're up to it, but I don't see really any other path forward. And 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 I mean like that's the only thing that I think is worth fighting for. And I think that like the fascism or the criminalism examples, the species might as well be dead, right? Like if we're under such extreme level that no one can like invent or tinker or anything else like that, it's it, we're dead anyway. So for me, the only frail line of hope is anarchy, is anarchism, is building a world of, of where everyone has an investment, where everyone uh, where no one is oppressed to such a degree that they would become suicidal in that regard. Um, and that kind of detente work, that kind of like, well, you know, we'll agree to disagree or we'll find a common consensus, those methodologies are things that anarchists have worked on for the last 200 years. So. Okay, yes. Uh, so you mentioned that Girls Project, that sounds pretty interesting. Are there other uh, emerging technologies that you're particularly excited about? Oh, I mean, there's tons. I mean, like, I'm, I'm really into, like, life extension. I'm really into, like, a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, Specifically, I spend a lot of time focusing on infosec work, so I, I, you know, I'm really interested in cryptocurrencies, I'm really interested in a lot of those kinds of things. I, I don't have like, a list off the top of my head, if you want to come back to the table, I will like, ramble off about